Before we go and give Lewis's account of language and convention and how conventions help us understand what language use amounts to, we're going to think about a simpler case. We're going to think about the case of signaling games. Let's start with a familiar story you probably learned in school. So you'll know hopefully about Paul Revere and the Lanterns. At a certain stage in the American Revolution, Paul Revere was tasked to warn everybody if the British were coming. And he came to an arrangement with the sexton of the Old North Church in Boston about what kind of signal the sexton would leave for him if the British were indeed coming. The arrangement was that if the British were coming by land, the sexton would hang one lantern in the Old North Church. If they were coming by sea, he would hang two lanterns. And if they weren't coming at all, he would do nothing. Now, of course, accordingly, Paul Revere himself had a plan of action what he would do in each situation, given what signal he would observe. If he saw one lantern, he would go and warn everybody that the British were coming by land. If he saw two, he would go and warn everybody that they were coming by sea. And if no lantern was hung, he would just go home for that night. He would do nothing. So this is a certain kind of an arrangement where we have one person who has access to something. The sexton was able to see whether the British were coming from the chapel and would do something in response to the way the world was. And we have Paul Revere, on the other hand, who doesn't have access to the way the world is, or at least in the relevant respects. He can't, for himself, observe whether the British are coming, but what he can observe is what signal the sexton is giving, and then act accordingly. One of the things, though, that we should pick up on about this example immediately is that there's is that there's sort of nothing special about the particular arrangement that the sexton and Paul Revere landed on. Okay, so in fact, the sexton would hang one lantern for British coming by land and two for British coming by sea, but it easily could have been different. There's nothing special about the actual, the relationship between the actual signal and the state of the world it was supposed to signal. Could have been that two lanterns meant the British were coming by land or that they were not coming at all. Could have been that no lanterns meant that they were coming by sea. So there's clearly a certain kind of arbitrariness in the way that the signals are picked. And again, this arbitrariness is something that should seem relevant and important to us what we, given what we already know about conventions and coordination problems. Indeed, this is beginning to look like a coordination problem because remember we said it's sort of definitional of, con of coordination problems that there are multiple ways of solving the problem of coordinating that are more or less equally good. What Lewis shows is that we can indeed actually think of this as a coordination problem. We can think of it as a particular kind of coordination game, and we'll call it a signaling game, as he does. And what's happening in a signaling game is that the two players are trying to coordinate on what signaling system they want to use. That's essentially what's going on in signaling games. But we can break that down in a little bit more detail. So first of all, in a signaling game we have two players and we'll call one the communicator and one the audience. Crucially in these games we think of the communicator as having access to the states of the world. So the world, there's a, there's a number of different possible ways the world could be and the communicator has access to which way the world is. They can make an observation which tells them how the world is. The audience does not have this ability. The audience cannot observe which state holds. And for this reason, the communicator is trying to find some way of sharing the information with the audience. So we'll say that not only does the communicator have access to the state of the world, but they also have a, a selection of signals that they can choose from. They can do something and they know that the audience is gonna observe it. So for instance, in the Paul Revere case, the signals are lighting one lamp, lighting two lamps, doing nothing. But all sorts of things could be signals. The important thing is that whatever we're thinking of as signals, there's something that the, the audience can observe. Again, that's something we see in the Paul Revere case. The, the lanterns were picked exactly because they're observable to Paul Revere. So the communicator can observe the state of the world and then they can then send some signals which they know, which everybody knows, the audience can observe. That's the basic setup. When we're thinking of this as a coordination game, what we're thinking of is that the communicator and the audience are trying to coordinate on their plans because they're both trying to choose between particular plans for what to do. The communicator is trying to coordinate, is trying to choose 
what plan they're going to adopt that tells them what to do, what signal to send in a given situation. A plan for the communicator, as we'll think of it, tells the communicator in any given situation exactly what signal to send. So in the Paul Revere case, a plan would be if the British are coming by land, light one lantern, if the British are coming by sea, light two lanterns, if they're not coming at all, light no lanterns. That's a plan that the sexton might be considering in the coordination game that Paul Revere and the sexton are engaged in. That's the plan the, that the sexton actually settled on in the, in, the, in, in the actual historical case. We can obviously see that there are other possible plans they could have adopted. The signals could have been flipped, it could have been that one meant by sea and two meant by land. So in these situations, the communicator faces a choice of which plan are they going to adopt. There are lots of different ways of correlating signals to states of the world. They have to choose one particular plan which tells them how they're going to correlate. So what the communicator is doing is they're trying to pick a plan that correlates the states of the world to the signals. The audience is also trying to pick on a plan, but the plan does something different. They're not tr obviously trying to pick on a plan that relates signals to the state of the world because they don't ac have access to the state of the world. Rather, what they're trying to do is pick a plan that relates the signal they observe to what they're going to do. So as a matter of fact, Paul Revere's plan is if he sees one lantern, warn everybody that the British are coming by land. If he sees two lanterns, warn that they're coming by sea. And if he sees no lanterns, go home. That's Paul Revere's actual plan. And it correlates observed signals, i.e. lanterns, to things that he could do, like go out and warn people or not. Again, he could have adopted a different plan. He could have warned the, everybody that the British were coming by sea if he saw one lantern. Or he could have warned people that they were coming by sea if he saw no lanterns. So there are, again, multiple different plans that Paul Revere could have adopted. What he's doing, what the audience is doing, is choosing between plans like these. Now we can see that overall what we're trying to do in situations like the Paul Revere case is transmit some information about the world to the audience that makes them act in the right way. Both the Sexton and Paul Revere want Paul Revere to go and warn everybody that the British are coming just in case the British are actually are coming. They're both invested in Paul Revere doing a certain kind of thing given that the world is a certain way. But that will only happen if they adopt the right combination of plans. So for instance, if we imagine the Sexton's plan is as it actually is, but Paul Revere adopts the plan that uh, he'll just go home if he sees one lantern, or maybe he'll just go home in any case, that wouldn't lead to an outcome that they both want. That would be a kind of mismatch between their plans. Or likewise, if Paul Revere's plan was the same as it actually was, but the, the Sexton's plan was to light two lanterns if the British were coming by land, again, there would be a mismatch between the plans. The Sexton's lighting the two lamps would lead to Paul Revere's doing the wrong thing. He would falsely warn everybody that the British were coming by land. So in a situation like this, for the two people to get the desired outcome, they have to act together in a certain way. And acting together in this case means picking a combination of plans that fit together in the right way, that produce outcomes that they want. So in situations like this, this kind of signaling game, we can think of the equilibrium outcomes as being ones where the audience does the right thing no matter how the world actually is. And we can see that those equilibrium outcomes are only going to come about just in case each person adopts a plan that fits with the plan that's picked by the other person. So that's what they're trying to coordinate over in these games. What they're trying to coordinate over is their choice of plans. Because you can see that certain choices of plans of, on, on the part of the communicator and the part of the audience will fit together. Those will lead to coordination equilibriums because they will lead to Paul Revere giving the right warning to people. Others will not be equilibria because they will lead to Paul Revere doing the wrong thing. The combination of the, the sexton planning to light one lantern if the British are coming by sea and Paul Revere following his actual plan, 
that would not lead to an equilibrium outcome because there'll be some situations where it leads Paul Revere to do the wrong thing. So signaling games are coordination problems in the sense of that we thought of before, but they're ones where what we're trying to coordinate on are the plans. The communicator and the audience are together trying to coordinate on plans for each of them to follow. So that's what a signaling game is. It's this special kind of situation where you have the communicator and the audience, they're trying to coordinate on plans in a certain way because the communicator wants to communicate to the audience that the world is a certain way which will then lead the audience to do a certain kind of desirable action. The historical example is of course a one-off because it was just a particular one-off event that the British were going to invade on that occasion. So this is just a signaling game, it's a one-off instance. But of course we can imagine the arrangement that the Sexton and Paul Revere came to could become a convention. So imagine if the British repeatedly invaded, maybe they invade every week or every month or something like that. We can easily imagine this coordination game turning into a convention. So these kind of signaling games can easily turn into conventions in just the same kind of way that, that co solutions to coordination games become conventions in every other kind of case. Moreover, it looks like plausibly this actually happens in certain other cases. Think about how we use hand signals. So imagine you're trying to help somebody park their car and you're signaling to them, doing kinds of things, motioning to them like this. That seems to indicate the, to, the, to the audience, the driver, that they should reverse. This again seems like a kind of signaling game because while as a matter of fact this is a particularly salient way of communicating or signaling to you that you have space to move back. The convention could have been otherwise. I could have, I could have made that gesture to signal that, um, that you have more space. I just didn't. So firstly, there's the same kind of arbitrariness with hand signals. So maybe there's a mo there is one mo most salient way of doing it, but any other way could have done, so long as we actually agreed and that's the, the, the way that we're actually going to signal. And just like before, so me, the person who's directing you to reverse, I have access to the state of the world that you don't, and that's what I'm trying to signal to you, and that will lead you to do a certain kind of action, namely reverse when there's space and not reverse when there's no space. So it really does look like that's a kind of case of a signaling game. But of course, this is something that happens all the time, and the, con and the solution that we've actually adopted to the coordination game, of me doing this when you have to when there's room for you to reverse, me doing this, when there isn't. That's something we do in every such case when they arise. So again, it looks like a convention in the sense that we talked about last week. The convention of using certain hand gestures to indicate to people that they can reverse or not, this seems to be a signaling game that has actually become a convention, according to Lewis. One reason why this class of games is really interesting, why signaling games are interesting, is that First of all, the signals in the games look like they're meaningful. So I already described, for instance, in the Paul Revere case, as one lamp as meaning the British were coming by sea, or this gesture as meaning that you should reverse. So it looks really natural in these games to say that the signals have kinds of meanings. But interestingly, the only reason why we want to say that they have meanings is exactly because they're used in a particular way in a signaling game. It's because I've chosen on, upon a certain plan as a communicator, and you've chosen a certain plan as an audience, that this kind of gesture has the meaning that it does. The meaning was not something I specified independently. Rather, it's picking a particular coordination equilibrium, i.e. settling on a plan for us both of how to play the game, that gives meaning to these signals. One further interesting thing is that, for all we've said, the signals could be anything. In particular, they could be verbal. In the examples we've seen so far, the examples haven't been verbal, they've been things like lighting lamps and making hand gestures, but that's only because of the particular examples we've been thinking about. There's nothing in the definition of, this, of a signaling game that says the signals can't be verbal. They very easily could be verbal. This then raises a sort of intriguing possibility. Could it then be that just use of language is a signaling game? Could it be that it's because we coordinate our actions in a certain way, I as a communicator choose a certain plan for how to use my words, you as an audience choose a certain plan for how to respond to my words? Could it be that we count us using a language because we've chosen a coordination equilibrium in a certain kind of 
signaling game. As I said, the, the, the possibility is sort of intriguing, but Lewis thinks that in the strict sense of a signaling game, it looks like the answer to the question is no. We can't really think of ordinary language use exactly along the lines of a signaling game. And the reason is that, well, when you think about it, the way that the audience side of things works in the signaling game is actually pretty different from how things work for the audience in real life and real life uses of language. Because in a signaling game, we said that the audience is trying to choose between plans of action. They're trying to choose a plan that tells them what to do in any given possibility for what the communicator might say. But that's not really how language use works. It's not the case that you have settled on a particular way to act, no matter what I might tell you. If you want an example, just think about this very lecture. Do you think you have a plan for what you should act in response to me doing, given all the things I've even said right up till now? It looks like no. It doesn't look like, in understanding language, you're thereby equipped with a plan that tells you what to do, given anything that I might say, or I might continue to say in this lecture. What instead looks to be the case is that you'd rather have a plan of what to believe, given what I might say. And in particular, especially maybe when it comes to uh, the contents of philosophy of language, you have a plan to basically just believe whatever I tell you. Or at least when I report the content of, say, Lewis's views, to believe that. So language use isn't really totally naturally thought of as a signaling game, not because there's necessarily a problem on the communicator side, but because there's a problem on the audience side. It's essential to signaling games that the audience is choosing between certain plans of action. But when you think about actu actual language use, so sometimes language use works like that, but often it doesn't. Often the audience is really just choosing a plan of what to believe, given what the, given what the communicator what might say. So that's why we can't think straightforwardly of language on the model of a signaling game. That being said, signaling games are a considerable number of steps in the right direction, Lewis thinks, and they do give us a model for how to think about how to actually think about conventional language, which we're going to start thinking about in the next video.